Thank you very much for the invitation to this summer school. It's a pleasure of being back here virtually again. First, I'm putting on the chat on Zoom the link to the slides in case you, you want to check them out. So today I'll be talking about object detection and deep learning. So the ESA, you already had an introduction to deep learning and specifically on convolutional uh, layers, convolutional neural networks. And today, um, we, me first, I'll be covering the theoretical part of how to apply these structures to solve the problem of object detection. And later, Carlos will present uh, works on session in which you will actually be using one of these models, already pre-trained, but you will learn how to adapt it for whatever task or problem you may have. So let's start with object detection. First, a brief introduction. Actually, this is already gave it, so I think I'll skip it. But if you want to know about me, you can reach me by email here or follow me on Twitter. Also, I'm from Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona it's a place where we have many research groups beyond uh, the university where Carlos is or where I am. There are many research groups. We have many researchers and people doing interesting work. So if you are looking for PhD positions, uh, for postdoctoral positions, I encourage you to check our offers in general. You can see this symposium that we organize every year where all the researchers, whether in the city or people who study in the city, maybe now there are places like in Facebook, in MIT, in Google, whatever, they come and gather together. So there's a strong network on deep learning. And also, if you are interested in our teaching, we have a lot of material online of our deep learning courses in case you want to extend what you are already learning at, in this super nice summer school. Uh, in particular, we have this postgraduate program that we're starting in November. So if you are interested on that, uh, please check this QR code or link when I, from the slides and you, that's run online. So this might be an interesting thing for you if you want to really learn more about deep learning. Okay. First, uh, for the topic of today, for object detection, I will first acknowledge Amaya Salvador and Miriam Belbe and Andreu Jurbao, who actually taught this lecture before me at UPC. And now I kind of, uh, many of the material I will be using is from them. This is the outline for today. Um, so let's start with the motivation about object detection. What is object detection? And why is it interesting to solve this task? Mostly, um, yesterday, when you were discussing about the, the basic architecture for uh, vision and trying to solve uh, image classification problems, the, the, basic, the, the basic task that we try to address then, it's called single object classification, which given an image, we have an object and we try to predict what's the class of that object. This, the task could be a bit more complicated if in addition to asking about the class of the object, the category, like it would be dog in this case, if we, in addition, they, we were asked to um, provide a bounding box. So this, this coordinates here, I would refer to them as bounding box, which basically means that we need to provide two uh, coordinates, maybe the top left and bottom right coordinates of the bounding box. That's enough to actually determine the spatial location of the object within the image, within the pixels of the image. Today, me, I will be focusing on this task, which uh, called object detection, which is a bit more complicated than just single object classification and localization. Now we can have multiple objects. We don't know uh, ahead how many objects we have in there. And for each of the objects in the, in the image, we would be asked to provide a bounding box and a classification. Okay, so it's a, it's a classification task, but also a localization task, and we don't know how many objects there are in the image. That's the, that's the task of object detection. That's the task where I'll be focusing and where Carlos will be focusing later during the lab. Later on, uh, with Alex, you will be also looking at another task that Carlos will just briefly mention, which is called instant segmentation, which is very related. It's very similar to object detection, but as you see here, you will be providing labels pixel-wise, but that's something you'll be covering later after uh, the session of me and Carlas, you, later you will talk about segmentation and how to provide pixel-wise labels. But with me, the, the, the challenge is to provide these bounding boxes. So the coordinates that define the bounding boxes and the class of the object within the bounding box. So let's think about a very super naive approach to this, uh, to this problem, how we could solve that with the tools that you saw yesterday. So one thing you could do is just try, so kind of a trial, trial and error. You could just look at maybe if, if in this area of the image, if there's any of the classes that we have in our catalog, let's, let's assume a very simple case in which 
instead of having the 1000 classes for imaginary world, you have three, right? So we have a softmax at the end with just three outputs. And what we do is we just um, test, try one bonding box in this location. We look at these pixels. So we crop the image over there and see if there's a cat, there's a dog or, or a duck. And the answer is no, we decide that there's no object in there. And then we just keep moving the bonding box in all possible locations and aspect ratios and sizes. Okay, so a very extensive uh, search over the image. And at some point, maybe one of these bonding boxes will be lucky enough to really be matched in one of the objects of the image. And in that case, hopefully our uh, network will have a prediction of yes, and we will have solved uh, object detection task. So as you can imagine, trying all the possible combinations of bonding boxes in terms of location, aspect ratio, and size, that's very, very inefficient. <laughs> And that's the, what I just described is not a very good practice. Uh, it's, very, it's a very inefficient practice. You're gonna be burning a lot of energy. So it's really bad for the environment. And I will describe you uh, other options which are much more efficient than what I just described. But I hope that at least now you understand the, the challenge that we are facing. So here, I mean, we'll just keep uh, looking around. So when training the neural networks, it's important to have data to train these you know, networks because we'll need to, to compute gradients. These gradients will backpropagate and will update the weights. And the more data we have, the more gradients and the more diverse gradients we'll have, the, the richer they will be, the better the model will be. So in terms of data sets in object detection, there are some data sets that are used by especially the scientific community to assess the performance of object detection models. As I will be referring to them, I will briefly introduce some of them. So traditionally, before the deep learning uh, uh, chimes, let's say, there were these data sets, uh, Pascal, it's a very popular one with 20 classes, okay, and that's the size of the data set. If you remember, with ImageNet, there were more than 1 million images, so you know, here we are dealing with a much smaller data set. Then there was something much larger called Coco that's being used quite a lot uh, still with 80 categories, so more categories and a larger data set. And actually, while most people don't use it much, in ImageNet, one subset of the images on ImageNet, they are also uh, annotated with bounding boxes. So you can also right, try object detection with images from ImageNet, but probably that's, that's not a very common practice. Most people doing object detection nowadays, they, they show the, the performance in, in Coco especially. That's a, when you look at one of these data sets, what you will find there are images and you will find bounding boxes. And for each of the bounding box, you will find the class because in the end, that's what we want our network to predict. Given an image, predict bounding boxes, and the class for each of the bounding box. More recently, uh, Google published uh, this data set that, as far as I know, that's the largest one for object detection. That's called the Open Images data set, and they are already in version six. Uh, so they just keep iterating. And if you really need a huge amount of, of data and labels, maybe that's a place that you want to look first, okay? Because they are open source and you can use them for many applications. Now that I introduce the data sets, I will really address the, 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 the main issue, which is how we can solve object detection with new architectures. I will be covering two big families of uh, architectures. One first family is called two stage, another one which are, which are called single stage. So in deep learning, similar to what happened uh, with uh, image classification. So in object detection, we, there was there were there was like two, two, two uh, periods in history. Let's say the period before deep learning, the period after deep learning. Here, uh, if if you ever saw the the performance of image classification of with deep neural networks on ImageNet, uh, there was something uh, similar to that, but with other models. That at some point there was a, a big increase, a big jump on quality thanks to introduction of deep neural networks for the task of first image classification with ImageNet and also that something similar happened in the, in the case of object detection for the data sets that I presented. So I'm not sure if these values are for, I guess they are for Pascal given the dates, but you can see that when deep learning uh, solutions were introduced, there was a big gain. Uh, this, this metric here on the left, it's called, oops, it's called, it's called MIP, means mean average precision and the higher, the better, okay? Um, so before deep learning, there were some solutions, and now after deep learning, there were some other solutions, and I'll be covering most of them 
I'll be covering the, the first ones, which are the, the most, uh, which provide the basics for object detection. So let's see what, what this RCN, SPN, and FASTERS, RCN, SSD refer to. What do they mean? First, two stage, uh, two stage solutions. When we talk about object detectors implemented with neural networks that have two stages, that's because there's this first stage in which the model, it doesn't redetect the objects, but it proposes regions that may contain an object. That, that's what's called region proposals. And this is the first stage. And then in the second stage, you, you really get the object detection. So what the, the, this, the first stage in which we generate region proposals, what it does is give it an image. It provides a subset, uh, a limited amount of bounding boxes that the algorithm thinks that maybe there's an object in there. But the, in this first step, stage, we don't uh, define what's the class of that object. It's just saying, okay, I think that there's something interesting there. Go and take a look a bit farther. So we can think about this first stage or the stage of region proposals as uh, class gnostic object detectors. Okay, because we have object detector that generates bounding boxes, but there's no class. So it's kind of just localizing objects in general. This is the first stage. So in general, what we're going to do then is we have uh, the image and in the first stage, we generate the region proposals. And later there's going to be a second uh, stage in which we are going to refine. Refine means that these, the, the coordinates of the bounding box that we produce, they will be adjusted. So we will just maybe modify them a little bit and classify, which means that we are going to assign a class to each of the bounding boxes. So these are the two stages, the first stage and the second stage. At GN, what we will have is uh, a list or a list, uh, we have a, a, a set of bounding boxes with the label, you see, and also with a confidence score because these algorithms, they also provide a confidence score. That would be like similar how uh, the architecture you saw on ImageNet, you had that softmax, which at the end kind of predicts some kind of likelihoods or probabilities of, of that predictions. So that's the same thing. So in object detection, we also get scores that, that estimate the confidence of the prediction. Notice though, that in this example, I am showing twice each of the animals, right? So there are two dogs and two cats. And that's very common. So that's, that's how the, uh, these algorithms work. So they, they tend to overestimate, to overdetect objects. But good news is that in addition to overdetecting the objects, we have these scores that provide uh, criteria to later out filter which of the detections can be discarded. But, but if you just really look at the neural network, the neural network uh, in general, it will predict much more object detections that, that actually are in the image. So a post-processing step is necessary. So that's here just to get a, an idea of what we expect. That's what you see on the left and on the right, what these neural networks will, will tend to do. So what are we going to do? How can we filter out all these detections? So there's a, an, an algorithm that it was already uh, proposed before the deep learning, uh, deep learning H, which called non-maximum suppression. But that basically what it does, it just keeps the, the, the detections with highest confidence and discards all those other detections that let's say they, they have a high overlap with uh, the detection with the highest confidence. And you do this iteratively and in the end you can filter out all the, all those, all the, the detections. So here you have a, a very simple example of this well-known algorithm. It's quite easy to implement called non-maximum suppression, right? So you see a phase. There are plenty of detections here. After running this algorithm of non-maximum suppression, we refer to them to it as NMS. We only have one detection. So thanks to this non-maximum suppression algorithm, at the end, we will just keep the dog with the highest confidence and the cat with the highest confidence. In this example, the dog, this dog, and this cat will be discarded. Okay, but notice that this is a post-processing step that you must do uh, on over the outputs of the neural networks. Let's look at the neural networks now. Um, here in, in this slide, I show the first 
of the models uh, that was using neural networks to solve the object detection task. So remember this is a two stage solution. So we have an image, we have the proposals. That's what you see over here. And then for each of the proposals, uh, it was fed to the neural network. Here this shape should be familiar to you with what you saw uh, yesterday. You have convolutional layers. In this case, there are, there are two. And then fully connected layers. And on, at the very end, you just classify the proposal. Okay. Notice that there's, there are some more things uh, over here, which is each of the proposals is being warped. It means that it's, it's kind of uh, precise so that it becomes square. Never mind if the original uh, proposal um, had another aspect value. And in this specific war, which was the first one or one of the first ones trying to solve this task, the region proposals, they were provided by a third party algorithm. So they used another algorithm that was already proposed that was not using uh, neural networks that produced region proposals, around 2,000 region proposals per image. And then each of these proposals was fed into the network and get classified. So at the end, you, we would have um, for each bounding box of region proposal, a class. And then if afterwards we apply no maximum suppression, we just, in the end, we just keep the object detections that we want to keep. Fine. So there is this problem though with this algorithm uh, called RCNN, maybe I, maybe I didn't mention. R uh, goes through for region and CNN because convolution neural network. But it has a, a one problem, which is that it's slow, right? Why is it slow? Because it will need to fit uh, for each of the proposals that we get, it will need to be, it will need to be fed through this neural net network. And every time that we feed data through a convolution neural network or a neural network, uh, there are many multiplications involved and many operations involved. And that makes it quite slow, right? Because remember that there, were, there, there are like around 2,000 region proposals. So uh, feeding 2,000 regions to a convolution neural network, even if you use a GPU, this can be uh, a bit slow and, and, and you'll see that not very efficient. So how could we avoid running multiple forward passes to the this convolution neural network. So the solution is actually to, instead of first having the proposals, cropping the proposals and feeding in them into the network one by one, what we're going to do is just take the whole image and feed the whole image into a neural network. And then at some point in a neural network, we are going to look at the proposals there in one of the deeper layers of the convolution neural network. If you remember from yesterday, uh, you learned that one of the nice things of 2D convolutions is that they, they keep, let's say, the spatial information of the pixel. So uh, the pixel on the top left corner is related to the feature map, so to the, to the features in the top left corner after these two layers. The, there's the, the spatial coherence is kept. So this means that if I have region proposals over the image, I can map them into one of the deeper layers and then then later move forward the, the region proposals one by one, but not, but from a deeper layer. Then the, so all these other previous layers, they will have already been processed and shared for all the objects. So this solution actually was uh, proposed by another architecture called SPP Netch, that uh, what it did is to compute the feature maps for the entire image only once, and this way avoiding to repeatedly compute the convolutional features. Fine. So here you can see kind of the, the difference that in RCNN we were having, oops, oh, we were having the image and then having the crops and then fed them to convolutional layers and then have the output. With SPPNet, what we have is the image. We feed the image to convolutional layers. In this world, they did something else called spatial pyramid pool pooling, but I will not focus on that, but they did something else and that they, they took the fully connected layers. Okay. Great. So we solved the first problem of RCNN, which was that we had to fit every region proposal through the network, but there's still another problem, which is that when we have uh, fully connected layers in a convolution neural network, that's what we have over here, they, in the end, they, they force to have a fixed input size. Um, so, 
so that never mind how large or how small is, is, is the object, they, they will, um, sorry, no, no matter how, how much or small is the, the region, we, we first need to warp the image so that all the dimensions match so that they, they match with the uh, fully connected layer. Okay, so when we have fully connected layers uh, in, the, in the network, in the end, um, that forces the size of the input data. There's, it, it's not that the features, they, the features don't adapt to the size of the input. So the feature maps can adapt to the size of the input when we use convolutional uh, operations instead of fully connected operations. So that, that's one of the reasons that in many cases it's, it's advisable to always use convolutional so they, they can just adapt to any uh, dimension of the input data. One way to solve that would be just by using uh, pooling layers, which pooling layers in, in the end is just, maybe you could take that like every channel and just uh, pull through each of the channels of the convolutions and in the end you will have something of a fixed size based on, on the convolutions. But there's an, another uh, option which is called the ROI pooling layers. So let's see how these ROI pooling layers work. So first of all, ROI means region of interest, okay? And why is it called like this? Because what we're going to do is we're going to do pooling, but pulling over one part of the image. In which part of the image? In our case, we will be do pooling over the region proposals. So we will have our image. Let's imagine that we have an image that we have, our, in this case, only one region proposal, and we want to focus in that area. We have some convolutions, layers, and at some point we have uh, tensor, which is the output of a convolutional um, layer, which means that the, the special dimensions, they, they are proportional to the special dimensions of the input. The number of channels, remember that it depends on the number of filters that you had in the previous convolutional layer. And when we do max, uh, sorry, uh, when we do ROI pooling, it means that now we only focus on this area. That's what we already saw earlier with the uh, SVP net. But now notice that we define uh, a grid of fixed size. So in this case, it's five by five. And the point here is that never mind how big or how small are the spatial coordinates of this uh, bounding box, of this bounding box, we will always have um, a grid of five by five. And in each of these cells of the grid, that's where we do the max pooling now. So if so, if, if the box maybe it was very large, maybe in one of these cells the, the, there will be uh, larger, there will be more features in there to do the pulling. If the if the if the size of the box was very small, maybe there will only be one feature value in there. But in the end, the nice thing is that we do pulling for each of the of these cells, and after doing the pulling, what we obtain here is a tensor of fixed size because basically the depth of the tensor does something that depends from us, depends on the, the, the number of convolution null filters from the previous layer and the spatial coordinates of now of this uh, region proposal, let's say of the tensor of this region proposal, actually it's fixed by the amount of cells that we have in our grid. Then after that, never mind uh, the size of the, of the region proposal and the aspect ratio, this, this part will always have a fixed size. If this part has a fixed size, now we can really use fully connected layers because remember fully connected layer are, is a layer in which each neuron is connected to all the activations from the previous layer. So that's, that's how it works and this way we can, we can uh, really feed into our network uh, images of any size because there's going, we will have this ROI pooling layer that will take, take care of making sure that at some point our tensors, they have a size it, that is predefined and that it's fixed. So this one, Oops. okay. So we go from a variable size to a fixed size. So this ROI pooling layer, it was uh, introduced and proposed also in this fast RCNN, which is a, a later um, iteration of the RCNN model. So we have still another problem, which is that in the RCNN uh, model, the first one, Actually, what they did, and I, I didn't mention that, is that if you look at the paper, what it is, they, 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 fit, they took the region proposals, they warped them, they fit them in the convolutional network, 
but it's not that they did not train uh, the last layers to actually predict these classes. But what they did is they just uh, look at the features. They just extracted the activations, the layer, and then they train another classifier. And let's say they, they just took the features of the shelf and they applied that to an, another solution, to a super vector machine classifier in particular. Um, in the after RCNN, in the next iteration, they just did what probably you, you, you had in mind, which is that um, they had a, a double head at the end that was that would do the classification and that was everything was trained end to end over the K object classes. The, let's say if, if we were playing with Pascal, this would be the 20 object classes of Pascal. It was the Coco data set that would be the 80 classes from the Coco data set plus a background class because uh, in many of these uh, region proposals, there is no object. So that you, we should allow the network also to predict that there is no object, that the region proposal was wrong. In addition to having this softmax layer to classify, they also added a regression uh, head, that's called. So it was predicting um, some values. So it's a regression task in which they are offsets for the bounding box. It means it's telling you, it's, it's adjusting the coordinates of the bounding box. So based on the region proposal, now that let's say, now that, that we are deciding that's a dog, let's try to adjust a little bit the coordinates of the bounding box to actually improve the performance. And that was the, the, the idea of uh, FAST RCNN. That's this model, the second one of the generation in which uh, now hopefully you understand what I'm, this figure, you feed the whole image. Then if you have uh, a proposal, you map the proposal over some convolutional feature map. You apply the ROI pooling. So no matter how, large, how big or small is this proposal, this after the ROI pooling, everything is of fixed size. Then they added two fully connected layers, a softmax, uh, fully connected layer and a softmax to provide the class, the category, and another fully connected layer and some regression outputs to uh, adjust the coordinates of the bounding boxes. So notice that there's this double head here at the output. So was there any gain? Uh, yes, there was a lot actually. If in terms of training time, uh, we went from 84 hours for, with RCNN to 9.5 hours, so almost nine times faster. And at test time, that's also much faster, around 146 times faster. So remember that now we, we don't need to fit each of the candidates to the network. And in addition, the, the accuracy, the mean average precision was even better. So that's, that's great. It was a, a, a great deal, right, to change from RCNN to fast RCNN. However, fast RCNN still has a problem, which is this region's proposal. So the generation of the region proposals, um, it was very, very time consuming. And that made uh, things uh, really, really tough. okay? So here, uh, what it talks about selective search. So this selective search is the algorithm that uh, RCNN and fast RCNN use to produce the region proposals. And uh, you see that like the part of feeding to the network in faster CNN, it's 0 0.32 seconds, okay? But the part of generating the selective search uh, approach, uh, uh, proposals, it took two seconds. So that's like most of the time at, at, at test time, it's the model is actually producing uh, region proposals. Not, not really feeding the data through the network. So what they did as the next iteration, they proposed another model called faster RCNN. And as you may uh, already uh, predict, what they did is they introduced the region proposals into the solution, into the neural network. So what they did is, if you start from the faster CNN architecture, so you have some convolutional layers and one of the layer, we have the region proposal with the ROI pooling, and then we, we predict the class properties and the box coordinates. What they did is they also train uh, a network that was predicting the proposals. So now what happens is that you feed the image, you generate the proposals, and then you go back to the ROI pooling and provide the class properties and the box coordinates. So that was the, the way to, to do that, to solve the, the problem. So they, they add this new branch. So now it's called kind of a multitask uh, 
data. So this, these layers now, they are used both to generate proposals and both to predict the classes in the box coordinates. And everything could be trained end to end. In terms of time, what happened now? So now we went from the two seconds of inference time. So it means like when, you, when you're not training, when you just have an image and you want to detect the objects, you go from two seconds to 0 0.2 seconds. So that's a order of magnitude of speed up and performance was actually the same as faster as CNN, faster and faster CNN. So that's perfect. We, are, we kept the, the performance in terms of accuracy and it's 10 times faster. So that would be the end of the story of uh, RCNN, faster CNN, and faster CNN. Uh, so here I leave you this meme of I am a deep learning engineer, okay, naming three object detection architectures. You can just say RCNN, and that's, that's good enough. There's a family of algorithms over there. Actually, uh, there's a still another one, which is called mask RCNN, that I think that Carlos will talk about it later, which in addition to predicting the class in the box, it also predicts the pixel-wise uh, annotations of, of pixel-wise um, yeah, predictions of the objects. But that's, that's coming later with Carlos and later with Alex. So you, you'll find later this, this uh, more detailed explanation about it. So from my side, I will I'll still need to cover the, the last, uh, the second uh, family of new architecture, which I'll call single stage. So remember that two stage architecture means that first there's some part that's doing the region proposals and then the region proposals, they are somehow classified and refined in a certain stage. In single stage, you should predict and you should have in mind already that probably there's not going to be region proposals and that's, that's correct. So actually uh, in the very, very early days of, of the detection with uh, deep learning, um, there were no proposal in the kind of the, one of the first attempts from uh, the team of Yale Kun. And actually they, they, they did they did something very similar to what I presented at the beginning. They just tried with um, many positions and special scales and, and then they tried to beat some heat map, but it was very, very, um, very, very inefficient. They needed to really look at many locations and that was not uh, feasible in terms of computation. But it was, there were no proposals, right? But actually they, they were paying a very high price for not having proposals. So the one stage, the one stage me methods, they have a challenge because uh, there are many positions and scales to test because there are no proposals. So you need to look, really look at everything. And what is nice is that um, the two stage detectors, they, they manage to parallelize the feature extraction, the feature extraction about, sorry, about the box uh, feature extraction across all the locations. So the box regression classification is not so costly anymore. So the, as, as you have the region proposals that kind of filters out and, and, and allows not having to look at all the possible positions. So how can we have this, the benefits of the two stage uh, detectors, but um, with the, uh, uh, okay, I guess there was a problem with the recording. So this, uh, model called YOLE, YOLE look once. It's, it's a first a proposal that didn't have any uh, object proposal. So what, what did they do? So they had an image and then they define a grid over the image. Let's say of S cells uh, times S cells. And then first for each of the cell, they predicted, so for each of the cell, they predict a bounding box and a confidence that that bounding box contains an object. So you can think that this part, it's similar to region proposals. So it's not giving the class, it's just telling, okay, if, if there was an object in this, located in, in this cell, centered in this cell, the bounding box would be like this. And I am this confidence score value, sure that that's an object. And that's one of the, of the branches that this model has. Well, not, not the branches, but you see, that's one of the types of outputs that this model has. This model, it has another type of output, which is called the class priority map, which says, given a cell, if you give me one of these cells, I will tell you what's the, what's the most uh, feasible class, most likely class that we will find over there. And here in color coded, it represents, so each color in this example, it represents a different class. So for example, it will be, uh, I guess pink will be for car, and this yellowish orange will be for bike and the bluish one will be for job. 
So in the end, it's telling you like, if there was an object over here, centered over here, the object would be uh, jock, okay? When you have these two predictions, when you know the bonding box, since the confidence of the bonding box is, and also if there was an object centered in each of the cells, which would be the class, uh, there's a kind of a post-processing that combines everything and provides a final detections. But the nice thing is that producing the bonding boxes and confidence and the class probability map is done in a single forward pass to the network. How do they do that? So they have an image, they feed it to a convolution neural network, there are convolutions, a fully connected layer at, at the very end, and at the end there's this tensor of 30 by 7 by 7. So the 7 by 7, that's the amount of cells that you see in the grid. If you start counting these cells, that's what it means. So that's a, a spatial dimension, 7 by 7. And now we need to figure out what's this, what's this theory. Because in the end, these theory channels, what they do is they encode this information that I was describing. Here you have a view of that uh, tensor of 7, 7 and 30. So 7 by, uh, and 7, that's the spatial coordinates. I already mentioned that. And now the theory they mentioned, so three output channels, they do the following. They, they do. For each location, they predict the probability of being an object and the bounding boxes if there was an object uh, in that cell, centered in that cell. But, and that maybe that's a little bit confusing to you, but uh, the model does not only predict one possible bounding box, but it predicts two. So that's why here there's another uh, chunk of five, uh, five channels that predicts that if there was another object, then the object coordinates will be uh, following this approach. And the remaining, so that's from the, so these are fifth channels and fifth more channels. The remaining of the 20 outputs, they are, they are the class properties. This will be like the one hot encodings or the output of, of a softmax layer um, for the 20 classes that they were trying to predict. If you remember, uh, when I talk about the Pascal dataset, they, uh, they had 20 classes. So that's, a, that's why we have here 20 channels. So one, ch one channel for each class. And you have one prediction for each of the cells. That's why you need this seven by seven spatial map over here. So in the end, this YOLO model is predicting uh, seven times seven. That's the, the size of the number of cells. Two times five, these are the bonding box coordinates and the probability of being an object plus 20 classes. So that's the size of the output tensor and that's the actual amount of outputs that the model predicts. The nice thing is that in one single pass, you get everything. And if you get half of the information, you can later predict the, the output of the object detection. If you want to know more about uh, this work, I encourage you to watch this TED talk by its creator, Joe Redmond. And also actually the story here, it's, it's interesting because uh, the creator of YOLO actually, he, he decided to stop working on object detection because he saw that there were risks on how um, this technology was being deployed. So uh, as he did that, I would also encourage you to use all this knowledge responsibility, responsibly and have an et uh, ethical use of all the, of the contents that we teach you in, in this school. Now, just a more recent and modern uh, architecture. There's an, another approach that it's also um, single pass, which actually what, what they do is they uh, predict the center of the object. And that's, that's uh, so the, the model now, it's predicting the center of the object and for each possible locations. And then um, it predicts the coordinates around the object. And that's nowadays, it's one of the fastest and most um, practical implementations for object detection. It's a, uh, it's a very nice work. But you must be careful because there's another work that it's, that it's uh, not from these authors, that it's also called CenterNet. So it's a bit confusing because there are two works that are called CenterNet. This one, uh, you, have, you can have the, the code here in the chalk and you see that it's, it's very fast to, to run. If you compare uh, CenterNet with other solutions that we have seen, here you have the inference time. So the faster, the better. And here you have the average precision. So the higher, the better. And you can see that CenterNet is quite fast. It's faster than faster than CNN and even a uh, uh, posterior version of, of YOLO. 
probably one of the state-of-the-art models nowadays. It's called efficient debt. Um, efficient debt, it's a model that it's based on a backbone. So that this is the backbone, which means that it's based on a, a set of layers that uh, it was found. So the, the parameters for the layers, it was um, found with newer architecture search. So basically it means that the developers, they, they tried many, many um, combinations of convolution sizes, filters, whatever. And one of them was better. So, and that was called the efficient net. And then, uh, so this efficient net, this is by Google, they uh, adapt it. So they, they extract features from different positions of the of these layers. And they did some okay, some combinations, let's say. At the end, they have this, the class prediction and the box prediction. And again, uh, that's probably one of the most efficient options that you can do uh, today. Here you have the values for uh, efficient efficient debt in terms of um, this case mega flops. So it means you want, you don't want much computation. So that's what you need for, for example, for mobile devices when you must be very careful with the battery. And you have the size memory size in terms of parameters. So you have very good performance with a small footprint in terms of parameters, so memory size, as well as computation. Just to finish, um, I know that you have not seen the transformer. You have this. Uh, super nice lecture with uh, Alfredo Ganzani on transformers, uh, I think in a couple of days. So, uh, so once you have that, maybe you can back to this slide, but actually nowadays in computer vision, things have also moved into a transformer architectures. And you'll see that probably Alfredo will be talking about uh, how to solve machine translation. Like if, if I have a, a token, a sequence of words, and each word is a token, and you go, and you go from English to let's say French, so you go from one sequence of tokens to another sequence of tokens. So what people have also tried is that if we take an image and we split it into tokens, which means like I split in cells and each of the, my cells, it's one portion of the image. And then I, I, I use it as, as if it was a sequence. Then I can fit that into this architecture called transformer that is state of the art for uh, many tasks and also solve uh, tasks like uh, image classification, okay, this is not loading, but there's an animation here of uh, something called the vision transformer, image classification. And actually I'm explaining that because there's also um, an application of that for object detection. So there's this work called swing transformers that uh, actually it's using uh, more or less the concept of vision transformer to do object detection or object segmentation. That's probably that nowadays it's not the most efficient solution in terms of computation, but that's providing state-of-the-art results for object detection. But again, if you don't, if you have not seen the transformer now yet, maybe it's a bit too early, but you maybe you want to come back to this slide later. Just to finish and sum up, I presented two main families, action, the two stage families that first they produce region proposals, and then we evaluate each proposal as if it was an object container and a single stage, we just have a fixed grid of cells like in YOLO. And then we just consider that each of the cells is a container and try to, to regress and classify if there was an object in there. That's the, some of the methods that um, you will find. Actually, if you look at the link of the slide, there are many more slides than the ones that I presented. And there are more pointers to more work, but I had to uh, cut it down to adjust to the timing that we have, but you can just check on the slides and, and, and click there. Here I give you uh, resources for, for uh, software if you want to play with all these implementations. Uh, there's this implementation also by Open uh, MM Lab, which is really good. And they are doing a great job on trying to do um, software that is reproducible. And also now, uh, Carlos actually somehow talk about how to do transfer learning. I mean, it's like if you have, let's say that maybe you train with the, one of these data sets with Pascal or Coco, but you're interested in another type of data from your application, how you can transfer that. And that's something that, uh, not sure if you saw it, but that's something that that's called fine tuning. Okay, more implementations on mobile. And I think that will be it. Uh, later, also in the appendix of these slides, you can see the metrics, what, how to compute this mean average precision in object detection that sometimes it's, it's not that obvious. You have a tutorial by Ross Gearsheet, the creator of Faster CNN, if you want to learn more. And that will be it from my side. Okay, yeah, I think that you can share uh, the slides. So I have just prepared 
a few slides and then I will go for a, a Python notebook for the for the tutorial on on object detection. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Everything is clear. Thank you very much and good luck. Okay. Thank you. So uh, you have already presented me, so I will just skip uh, the details about uh, me being lecturer at Universidad Oberta de Catalunya. Uh, just let me add that uh, we, well, I, I belong to a research group that it's called Sin Understanding and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Uh, so every year we, we, we have like some PhD grants and and we have also have the possibility of doing a, a PhD program online uh, with part time or full time. So if any of you are interested interesting on doing a PhD on computer vision or some related with artificial intelligence, uh, you can contact me. Okay. So uh, the idea of this tutorial, as Xavi already introduced before is the, uh, that we will be using uh, the mask RCNN, that there's a, a public framework that it's called the Tektron, where this uh, architecture is implemented. And this is a very good implementation for different tasks that are related uh, to object detection. So we will see that uh, the object detection with boxes or with bounded boxes, as Xavi was uh, commenting before, with the top left and the bottom right uh, vertices of the bounding boxes, and also uh, more related with the Alex talk uh, that will be later. Also, the object detection detection with the instant segmentation mask. So, which are, which specific pixels from the image belong to that specific object that has been detected? Okay. So, what we can find at Detectron? So, we can find uh, different tasks. Uh, so, it say we can find the 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 bounding boxes of the object detected, also the, the segmentation mass, but there are other related tasks that you can just play with this framework, uh, like the key points, like the elbow or yeah, like different key points for pose estimation, also dense pose, not only just the key points and uh, the semantic segmentation that it's similar to instant segmentation, but it also including what we call stuff like the sky or the road and things that are not are not considered as as objects. So it also includes many models. Uh, we will be using the mask RCNN model, but it also includes faster RCNN that has been already introduced by Xavi, by Xavier, and other, uh, and other models, other architectures that have been implemented, okay? Uh, if you check the, the web of Detection 2, you can find uh, this model zoo where there are many, many models available. So with the code, you can just refer to one of them and use that specific model. So finally, just related with mask or CNN, uh, let me tell you that there are like two different architectures. Uh, I'm not sure if yesterday uh, you see one of the concepts that it's called fit, uh, feature pyramid network. So the idea is that there are two different implementation of faster RCNN, one that includes uh, this feature pyramid network and another one that it doesn't include. The performance of the one with the feature pyramid network is uh, slightly better than the one that it's not including this, this pyramid. Okay, so yeah, with no more dilation, let's move to the Let's move to the tutorial. I have shared you uh, this tutorial on, on the Slack. So you will have available uh, this, no, this notebook, this Python notebook uh, on, on the Slack channel. So you can 
just play with it afterwards, okay? So, or, or, or even you can also just download it now and you can just run this, uh, this code at the same time uh, than, than I do, okay? So first of all, uh, as always with this kind of, uh, of architectures, the first thing we need to install some libraries that are required to, to use the code, okay? So basically we are installing Torch and Torch Vision that are uh, some libraries required. Uh, this is already included on the Google Collab, so you you can just use it, uh, use this tutorial on on the Google Collab. The the only thing is that I think that the current version of Torch installed on Google Collab it's the 1.9, and for Detectron for using Detectron you need to use the the version 1.8. So you know you need to specify this 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 version and not using the the current one yeah i, I already downloaded it before but my session was disconnected so sorry for waiting for this time of uh, downloading again and installing uh, these these libraries. You can see what I was telling you before that they are th this is uninstalling the version one point nine, and then the one point eight will be installed. Okay. So in the meanwhile, uh, I would just suggest that you, do, you also download the, the notebook from the Slack and, and you can also play with it and installing uh, these libraries to, to play with it, okay? So, Carla, the, the students, they, they in the chat, they yes. ask that they can only see the notebook on plain text. They are asking for the link to the collab notebook. Really easier. Mm, I think that okay. I mean, I will try to to also upload it here. Mm. Maybe you can use share, share button in the top right area of the screen. Yeah, I'm just trying to go to the chat. Okay, now. Yeah, just follow the chat. Actually, one, one of the students, Powell, is suggesting that you can download. So I guess that's a solution for everybody. You just download the notebook locally and then you upload it yourself. You drive, then yeah, it's what it's it's what I did. I just download the the Python notebook and I just upload on on the Slack. But I don't know why it's put like a like a text file and not. So maybe now. Ah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they they can just download that that file and 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 upload to to collab and that that should be working in any case i just share uh, the file also on on the chat on the zoom okay okay so torch and torch vision are already installed then what we do is installing this specific framework that it's detect on two okay this is faster to install and uh, let's start. So we need to do some some imports uh, for some uh, functionalities, some utilities that we will need from Detection 2. Okay. So uh, what we will do, 
So first of all, we will just be using some pre-trained model uh, on that it's available on the Tektron 2. So let's just download an image from the Coco dataset. Uh, we have uh, this person that is riding a horse with some people at the back with umbrellas. And let's try to detect the objects on, on that image using a model that has been trained on, on the COCO dataset. Okay, COCO is one of the datasets that Xavi was referring uh, during his talk. So, uh, as I was explaining you before, there are like many models uh, available on Detection 2. So, uh, here I have just selected one of them. This is the mask RCNN that it's not only doing detection and it's also doing instant segmentation. And it's uh, the one that it's including uh, the feature pyramid network, okay? So we select uh, this specific model. Okay, so we select the model, we define the, the predictor uh, that you need as I input the configuration file that it's the, the variable that we have uh, defined before. And finally, this predictor, uh, we pass the image as input and we get as, a, as an output uh, a variable that we just call outputs, okay? So, Let's see which, let's, let's take a look at this output just to understand what we have, okay? Before, visualiz before any visualization of, of, the of the results on the image. So if you do a print of the outputs uh, of like in a dictionary of instances and a specific field that it's called red classes, this is an array where you can find which are the classes or categories that have been detected on that image, okay? So that would be these values here, 17, 0, 0, and so on, where each of these values represents to a specific category. For instance, the zero uh, corresponds to, to person, okay? So there are many persons that have been detected on on that image. If we also do the print of the output instances spread boxes, then what we have is like uh, the coordinates of the bounding boxes of the different instances that have been detected, okay? So for the first instance, uh, we have these coordinates, okay? We have four coordinates. Two of them corresponds to one of the corners, to the uh, to the top left and the other one corresponds to the other corner, the, the bottom right, okay? So since we have detected several instances, we have several bounding boxes, each of these bounding boxes correspond to one of these instances detected, okay? Okay, so, okay, this is like, uh, let's let's do in a, in a cooler way that it's using a, a class that it's included in, in the detection to framework that it's called uh, visualizer that allows to just show this information but uh, in a more, well, uh, more visually, right? So you can see here that uh, the results have been printed uh, on the images. So you have like the bounding boxes here, for instance, you can see the person riding the horse, the bounding boxes, and not only the, well, the bounding box, also the category that it's, uh, it says person, also the, the confidence score. So you can see here that has been uh, detected with a 100% of confidence score and more related with the talk that will be give will be given later by by Alex. Uh, also, the instance mask. Okay, so the specific pixels belonging to to that object. Okay, 
and you can see also other objects like the horse, persons on the back, also some, some umbrellas, even uh, a backpack here with uh, a lower uh, confidence score, but it's also detected, okay? Okay, so if, if just print uh, the output instances, here you can see all, all the information that it's been stored. So there are 15 instances that have been detected. And for each instances, you have the bounding boxes, you have the confidence scores, so the detection scores. You also have uh, the, classif the, the categories for each of the instances. And finally, you have uh, the segmentation mask for each of the instances, okay? It seems that each segmentation mask, it's all false, but the reason is that, the reason is why uh, the image is very big. So each matrix represents one of the masks, but there are no detection on, on the corners of the images. So these are just like the, the pixels that, be, that are like closer to, to the corners of the images that are no, no instances detected at all, okay? For instance, if I just go to the first instance mass of these instances, so I, we, we just write output instances, we go to the variable pred mass and just the first one, we have a specific mass for one of the instances detected. And if this mass, we just put it to the CPU and we convert it to a NumPy array, we can just do a visualization of this specific mask, okay? So we can see here that this would be the mask pre predicted for, for the horse, okay? Okay. So uh, we have used a model that it includes the feature pyramid network, but we can also use other models that are included on the detection tube framework. For here, we have like an example for a, for a model that is faster. Uh, it's instead of the feature pyramid network, we have here another one. If we use If we use this other, if we use this other model, and we just uh, visualize the prediction of this model, well, we can see that it 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 was uh, quite good, but there are like uh, some errors that w that were not done by the by the model, including the feature pyramid network. Okay, for instance, here we have the backpack that it's missing, so it's not being detected, just in comparison to, to the one, to the previous result. Or for, or for instance, we have here a false positive, that it's that it's been detected, uh, the model is detecting a bicycle, but there's no, no bicycle there. At least the, the confidence is uh, quite, low, it's uh, 51, so maybe using like a different threshold, uh, you could avoid some of these uh, false positive detections, okay? And these are some results that have been used uh, with models that have been trained with COCO, but there are also other models that have been trained on other data sets. For instance, uh, if you are interested on autonomous driving or some application related with, with this. Maybe you are interested on some data sets that are more like similar to be, to be driving in, in a city with uh, some buildings, cars, um, and so on. So you can also find a model that has been trained on a data set that it's called Cityscapes and we can do just the same. So we can just uh, load this model that has been trained on cityscapes. 
And even this image, it's not like a classical one for these urban scenarios uh, for driving. We can do the same. So we can just apply this model uh, to this specific image. And we can see that some persons on the back are also detected. But for instance, the horse is not detected because a uh, horse is is not one of the categories included on, on this specific data set, okay? And finally, before uh, training on a custom data set, uh, I, there are some models that are related with other tasks like panoptic segmentation that probably uh, Alex will introduce you later uh, on the next session. So, just let me tell you that on the Texon 2 framework, you have also models uh, for for this other for this other task. Okay. So here are the difference is now is that instead of only segmenting the objects, you also have the categories for things that are not objects that we call stuff. So all this background is is labeled as tree all the, the ground is labeled as dirt and also the fence is detected. So they are not only, we are not only detecting objects on, on the image, okay? Okay, so we have seen how to use these pre-trained models on, on these data sets directly to, to an image. You can just play with any image uh, from Coco or even from, from yourself. But let's do uh, what, what Xavi was introducing in the, in the end of, 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 his, of his talk, that it's the, the fine tuning or transfer learning, okay? So let's suppose, let's suppose that, okay, we have like a very cool model that works very good in, on Coco dataset but I want to use this model for another task where we have like another categories that are not the ones from Coco, okay? So I have just prepared uh, this, this example that it's a small data set that includes three different categories of fruits and nuts that are date, fig, and hazelnut. And uh, this is the the original uh, the original data set can can be downloaded from this github so we just download it and uh, the textron is already ready for doing this transfer learning so one of the things that you need to do is uh, like register well the, like register this the information of this data set as coco instances so there are some functions that are already prepared for that so we call these register coco instances and we will use a json file that it, it includes all the information about the ground truth that about which are the, the categories of its images and the bounding box and so on, and also which are the images. Okay, and let's visualize just one, one, one example of one of the images of, of this data set, okay? So you can see here, this is a ground truth, okay? So here you can see some dates, uh, also, there's here one hazelnut, another one here, another one here, and also there's one, one a, a fig here, okay? So this is like one example of the images included on, on this data set. Okay, so now we want to, to train uh, one of the models uh, from, well, the masker CNN, for instance, but you can take any other one. I will, I will take the masker CNN with a feature pyramid network that is one, one of the models that it's working best. So what we do is 
just speci specifying that we want to use this model that has been portrayed on, on Coco. We will specify which is the data set where we want to train the model. So here we need to specify fruits nuts that has been defined before here, okay? Now we will just do the train and we will not use uh, any, any image for testing, okay? The, num the number of workers, uh, the number of images per batch, let's just use uh, two, uh, the, the learning rate, the number maximum of iterations. This is a very small data set, so with just 300 iterations, uh, it is enough. And also the number of uh, region of interest that will be used per very much, okay? In this case, big, the images are very simple. They are like some objects and and so so with a number like 128 is enough, okay? So one of the important things that that you need to to set is the variable number of classes, okay? So this is uh, how many categories you want to detect on your own data set and has been already labeled for, for your own data set, okay? In this case, we have just three classes that are data, fig, and hazelnut. So we just specify three, okay? And finally, once this configuration file has been already set, we just define a trainer uh, to do uh, to do the train of, of the model. Okay, so we run this training. This is about uh, a couple of minutes, more or less, and well, while the training is doing. Just let me tell you that uh, one of the things that is included on, on Google Collab uh, is uh, an extension that it's called TensorBoard that it's also used in, in the TensorFlow uh, framework. So the TensorBoard will allow you to just to check uh, how the training is doing. So which is the progression of, of the losses during your during your training so you should you should be able to check that the loss is decreasing and for the masker cnn uh, we have like several losses one it's about uh, the categories so that you are detecting the categories correctly we also have about a loss about their progression so you are uh, detecting correctly the bounding boxes of its instances and you also have another loss that is related with with the instant segmentation task so how how good the pixels have been labeled for that specific object okay not just not just the the bounding box but also the specific pixels inside that bounding box so yeah, the, this training should finish soon. It's almost two minutes now. Okay, if you want to just run this experiment, this experiment faster, you, you can just reduce the number of, of iterations of, of your training. And apart from the tensor board, here you can also see like the the progression of the loss in a so in in in, te in a textual format. Okay, the total loss, the loss about classification, about box regression, and also about the about the mask that were the ones that I was telling you before. Okay, now it's. Okay, we we have specified uh, three hundred iterations, so 
we are already almost there. Okay, so what I was telling you before about the TensorBall, you can just use this extension. So this is very useful to, to know if you are doing uh, your training properly. So, well, the, the most interesting variables are the one related with the loss. So for instance, the loss box regression that it's uh, about how precise, how good or how precise the, 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 the vertices of the bounding box are. So you can see that with the, as, as we advance with the number of iterations, we are decreasing the loss, that, that's good. And you can also check the loss about the classification that it's also decreasing. And you can finally also check the loss regarding the mass that it's also decreasing. So, uh, we are getting better and better uh, predictions uh, in the as we are increasing the number of iterations for training. Okay. Okay. So once we have the model already trained with, for our specific data set, uh, we can just. Uh, we can just specify which is our model that has been already saved to, to Google Colab, and we can decide which threshold for detection we will be using. For instance, we can use 0 0.5. So we, we are specifying that at least we need a confidence of, of 0 0.5 uh, to show a prediction. And if we, just use the default predictor uh, for this fruit snatch data set, then we will have all the predictions on, on the images from this data set, okay? So let's see, for instance, the results for one specific images. For instance, the, the image with the, with the index one. Okay, so this is uh, this is not the ground truth. This is the results from from the prediction. Okay, so from the model that has been trained. So the all all of them has been uh, properly detected. Okay, so however, one of the problems of this original data set is that uh, we have just trained the model on the train ball set and we are just uh, doing the predictions on images that are from this from that are from the same uh, training set okay so one of the things that i have done is just doing a split of this small data set on two different uh, subsets one for training and one for testing so we are not like doing uh, doing the trick of just doing predictions on on images that have been already seen during training. Okay, so you can download this this other data set that is just the same but with with uh, with the split. So it includes in, instead of including a a, tra a train ball JSON, it includes two different JSON files, one for training and another for validation. So I just do the unzip of, of the zip file. I replace everything. We need to register the Coco instances, both from train and validation. We also do the this dictionary for training and validation. Yeah, this is like, it has been done for every time that you want to configure uh, uh, your custom data set, okay? And, okay, so this for instance is one of the images that it's from training. And here you can see 
one of the images that it's from the validation or, or test, okay? So this image will not be used during training and we will be using this, these images from this second subset just for, for testing the, the model, okay? So again, uh, we train again the, the model, but now we specify that the, the train set is only the fruit snatch train. So only the images from this subset will be used for training. And we specify that the ones from the ball subset are the ones that, we'll, that we will be using for, for testing, okay? I'm using just the same values as before, just to compare with the with the previous with the previous model that we were cheating because we were using uh, the predictions on the images that we're using for training. Okay, and as as I said before, the important thing when you are using your own data set is to specify uh, the number of classes because at the end is the number of outputs that you have your fully your your last fully connected layer from from your architecture okay Carlos, 5 minutes 5 minutes thank you very much yeah thank you okay so yeah, with this example, we are just finishing the tutorial. So let's let's wait for the model being trained. But let me okay. Let me also telling you that uh, okay, this this was like an easier data set because the the annotations were already available on on the Coco format. So but sometimes maybe you want to build your own data set and you need to to do the annotation so uh, which are the bounding box which are the specific pixels for each object and the Tectron 2 is expecting uh, the coco format so if you want to know find more information about how to build your own data set uh, with the coco format you have here this this link where you can find more information related with this okay okay so yeah we are almost there we are also ex uh, waiting for the 300 iterations for this model And we'll, what I will do is just do a visualization of which what, which is the result with the with the current model, the one that has been well trained with us with split it set for training and validation. Okay. So. Yeah, this is yeah, check. Yeah, this is the one that has been trained now. And this is the one that has been trained before, like the cheating model that the the images were were included on all of them on the training set. And this is the ground truth. So you can see that now that we were not cheating, there are like some errors. Like this is detected as a date, but if you check the original image and the ground truth, this is not a date. So there are some errors that, that this is like common when you are, well, it's not, so it's not what you want to have, but at least you you can you can expect having some some errors on detection. Okay, so like the ones produced on on this example. So this is everything from my side.